Mike Green, I'm here in Marin County, and I'm reaching out across the world to my friend in London, Christian Angermeyer. Christian, you and I have known each other for a number of years through a couple of different vectors, through Steve Drobny, through Peter Thiel. Um, you are an investor through your private family office, Aperon, and in particular, we're here to talk about two companies that you've become involved with, Compass, and Compass Pathways, and Atai Life Sciences. Both of them are tied into the psychedelic space. And so I, I've done other interviews around cannabis stocks, et cetera. But this is a new move into an area that most investors have no exposure to or have very limited exposure to and that traditionally would have been thought of as very, very fringe. But these two companies are doing something very mainstream, right? So Compass is extremely focused on the idea of psilocybin in the treatment of depression, magic mushrooms, the active ingredient in them. And Atai brings that in a much broader sense, basically exploring what have traditionally been used as recreational drugs or illicit drugs and exploring their pharmaceutical properties for the treatment of a wide variety of conditions. Now, Compass is public and Atai, by the time this comes out, we're, we're pre-recording this, but by the time this comes out, Atai will also be public. I'd love to understand how you got interested in this space, right? What was it that drew you into trying to understand the role that these historical drug compounds played in society and the treatment of illnesses and how they could work in the 21st century? All okay, right, so first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, um, I like talking about psychedelics, so it's my favorite topic, uh, obviously. Um, so let's, yeah, so I try to make it short, but also long enough because I think my personal journey, because a lot of people might think, oh my God, this is insane or this is crazy. It's actually changing a lot positively. Like, so as you say, like people think more about it and see it as, as what it really is. Like, I think psychedelics are the best shot we have on, uh, curing and mental health issues. Um, but still, I know a lot of people like might think, okay, is it too crazy? So I think my story can show a little bit like that I, how you can ease into it. So a long, long story making pretty short is like, um, as you might remember, because most of my friends know, like I have never ever in my whole life drank alcohol, uh, although I'm from Bavaria and that means a lot because like their beer is like our daily uh, nutrition. Like I've never drank alcohol um, yet. I've never smoked a cigarette, never smoked a joint, never took cocaine. I never did anything uh, in the drug world. Actually, I drank coffee for the first time when I was 28 and I was like, oh my God, this is so bad. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it's important because I, I'm not like, like, okay, we should do everything all the time. So, and then like, it was actually 2014, uh, 13, 14, um, one friend at a dinner made a joke and said, oh my God, Christian, it's so boring, like you never drink alcohol with us. Like here is actually a very famous scientist yeah, um, who, is a, who is dealing with drugs in generally. And I'm going to place you next to him at the dinner. And he can tell you a little bit more why you could drink a glass of alcohol with us and not die. I mean, to be fair, I don't think I'm going to die when I drink alcohol. I just don't do it because the social pressure is so high. I think alcohol is in general is super bad. Yeah, but and the only way in our society, which is very sad, not to drink alcohol is never drink alcohol because then nobody is bothering you. Anyway, so I sat next to Reiner um, and he told me practically what I just said. I said, look, you know, you could drink alcohol a bit, not gonna die, it's not good for you though. And then he showed me, and everybody who's listening, go online and do it. He showed me one super... In Sorry for interrupting your video, but I have an important message to share. At Real Vision, we pride ourselves on providing the very best in-depth expert analysis available to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. So if you like what you see on Real Vision's YouTube channel, that is just the tip of an iceberg. You should come over to realvision.com and see how we are not leaving any stone unturned from publishing more in-depth videos, live discussions, written reports, and our latest feature, The Exchange, where you get a chance to engage with experts and fellow subscribers and learn from everyone's experience. It is an experience which you live and you learn from. So if you go to the link in the description or go to realvision.com, it costs you just $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. You know, you could drink alcohol a bit, not gonna die, it's not good for you though. And then he showed me, and everybody who's listening, go online and do it. He showed me one super 
interesting chart. Um, it's actually a colleague of him in the UK. He's, his, his name is David Nutt. He's the drug czar of the UK, like the best scientist in that field. And David wrote a great book about it, uh, about the misconception we have about drugs. And the core of the book is one chart, which lists every single legal and illegal drug you might have ever heard of a, uh, and, and gives it a, a very comprehensive, very accurate risk score. Yeah? On the very left, with the biggest sort of risk score of all, yeah, you have alcohol. So mm -hmm. overall, alcohol is the worst drug you can take. And on the very right, with practically zero risk, it shows you all the psychedelics. So this is what he showed me. And he said, Christian, if you want my honest opinion as a scientist, you should do magic mushrooms. Yeah, that's on the very, very left, uh, very, very right. I was like, Ryan, are you crazy? Like, this is an illegal drug. Like, I'm not doing it with an alcohol. Like, anyway, but my interest was spiked. So he started sending me all of the, um, the research which was done mainly in the last century, yeah, because actually magic mushrooms, or as you said, the active ingredient of psilocybin, had been legal uh, in Europe, actually done by Sandals, maybe some other brand, um, for the treatment of depression. So it's not just a, an assumption we know about risks and upside. It's actually what well, there were studies. This was it's one of the most well researched um, compounds actually. So he sent me all of that, and it kept me or it started me, got me thinking about it. And I'm very, very spiritual. So my, my general belief about opportunities and anything in life is that the universe is sending you messages. You just need to listen or, or, or realize them. So once that has started, that once Reiner told me about it, a lot of people started mentioning psychedelics in my life. Yeah. So till exactly more or less one year later, I was in the Caribbean. So it's important to say, because people might say, hey, I want to try it in a country where it's legal, and there are countries in the world where psychedelics are, and especially mushrooms, are legally accessible. So I was in a place and friends had real magic mushrooms. Why I say real? Because I saw it. It was like, this, this looks like a mushroom. Yeah. Um, so I was like, kind of, because otherwise, meaning I'm such a coward. People always think, oh, Christian is so, is so uh, adventurous. Like, I'm a very big coward when it comes to my health. Yeah, so I was like, okay, but it looks like a mushroom. I read all about it. I trust my friends. It's the right environment. Yeah, it was like with my best friends on a beach. Yeah, so I took it, and hands down, it was the single most meaningful thing I've ever done in my whole life. Full stop. Nothing comes close. Um, so the next day, I was like, okay, if it's doing this strong, uh, if it's giving me this kind of strong positivity, me, and it's important because a lot of people come to mushrooms or any form of psychedelic from a, from a place of searching for healing. I didn't search for anything. I'm a very happy person. I was already before. I, I, I sort of always think it's my parents, like, you know, I mean, we were recording that, but tomorrow is Mother Day. I think my parents did something <laughs> very well with me. Yeah, so I was always happy. I don't think I'm dumb. So this was one of the main reasons why I didn't drink alcohol and anything else. I was like, Actually, I, my mind is pretty good. Yeah, so I have the genetic jackpot when it comes to my mind. So this is why I was like, don't jinx it, don't put anything into it. Um, but then I was like, okay, if mushrooms can do this, can add this positive amount to me, where I'm already thinking that I'm very happy, I completely get it how they have the potential to cure various mental health issues. So that was the start of my journey thinking about how to get them back into the medical world um and uh, yeah here we are so that was the beginning so now i don't want to make a monologue out of it no, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to expand on that and offer a personal anecdote that i've never publicly shared before right but um i had a similar experience i was much younger in life and you know like many um uh young people today would would characterize myself at 17 18 as borderline depressive right so uh, there was a lot of frustration a lot of anger etc um i had a similar experience did it in a place that it was not legal but then again i was you know young and uh it's enough you know, ago like it's like it's long enough ago the, that, that yeah, the statute of limitations has expired on this right but it had a transformative impact on me as well, taking me from angry and frustrated and thinking about the world as stupid and not fitting my objectives to opening up my view to the opportunities that were created by the gifts I'd been given, et cetera, right? And um, that lasted an extraordinary period in my life. And so I, I, you know, I have been exceptionally favorably disposed 
to the work that you and others are doing in pushing these types of treatments. And I think a lot of people struggle with the separation between the recreational treatment of it and the therapeutic treatment of it. And we don't, it's very well researched, as you point out, but there are aspects of it that are very frightening. You alluded to one, which is, am I going to change my brain? Am I going to ruin myself, et cetera? That's absolutely something that people should be thinking about. What's your reaction to that, right? Is there is there a negative aspect to the risk of changing the way that you approach the world? I would say not at all. Um, just thinking about the question a bit, like, so let's start with the, the medical side of it or with the, um, with the sort right, of- so What's the actual mechanism that's happening here? What's it, it you know, is this a, so we, you, you started with alcohol and I, I, I would just emphasize to readers that most forms of drugs are a form of poison, right? They, yes. they, they affect your body by causing a reaction internally, right? So alcohol is poisoning your body, basically slowing your responses, creating lethargy, which you interpret as social lubricant, right? It makes you less stressed, right? Um, yeah. Marijuana, likewise, is a checking out. Psilocybin is a very different experience. Maybe you can explain a little bit more the mechanism and pathway that it, that it approaches and, and why it feels so much more intense or why it um, yeah. is so radically different. And by the way, let's just like, because we jumping a bit and you said it in the beginning, like I just want to clarify it. So, so psilocybin is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, yeah, which is oh. one out of many psychedelics. Yeah, yes. And sort of the, the family name of the group is psychedelics, yeah, which gives you sort of, the name says it, like a, um, a, a, a hallucinogenic experience. Um, and just saying like, so so we have this one company, Compass, which is focusing on psilocybin, maybe yep. for depression and other indications. And then uh, I have a, a platform company uh, called Atai, where we own um, a significant stake in Compass, but also develop practically all other psychedelic substances which make medically sense for the medical world just like so we can't but so i, I why i'm saying is it's just like the nuances because uh, but let's yep. say it indeed mushrooms because it's sort of the most known pop culture most relevant whatever i just want because not that people mix up like if i give one answer about risk and how it works for mushrooms it might be a bit different for others because they all similar but different just say like so that we don't 100 percent agree and i also want to emphasize that what you're doing is you're working within a an actual licensed um pharmacological exactly. setting the biggest risk that you run in any illicit drug is the impurities that could exist with what you pick up on a street drug etc right so, so so on the professional side like or meaning with, with a tie and compass we running fda sort of supervised clinical trials. So we're allowed to do that. Yeah, we're not selling it and our, at the moment. And our goal is, though, not to make them, it's also very important, not to make them legalized in a, in a how do you say in English, in a commercial B2C way. Yeah, this is right. not a consumer product, like cannabis went in some, in some states and some countries. Yep. So we deeply believe that they are, all the whole group of psychedelics has an enormous value in the medical world, yeah, Actually, even in a narrow form of the medical world, in terms of it also not going to be a prescription drug from our point of view, it is something you should do or have to do in a legal way then with, with your therapist together. Yeah. And no. by the way, just then, then I come to your question is this is how they were always used. So, so I know some people are out there more on like the, the left and say, oh, the Christian is like wants to make it again in a form of regulated way. And like, why don't we give it to everybody? Yeah. But truth is, if you look at the history of psychedelics, um, which I'm very interested in and it depends when the thing comes out, there might be big news uh, about the university thing where, where we go more into the historical significance of psychedelics, actually not just in the last century, but also actually over thousands of years, maybe even hundreds of thousands of years, psychedelics have shaped humanity and how we developed as a species. But always, now comes to the point, every single thing we can point to from the Eleusinian mysteries in, in Greece to the Sekhmet cult in, uh, in Egypt, it was always under the guide of a priest, of a shaman. Yeah? And the modern shamans are the therapists. These right. are the modern priests, the modern shamans. So we want to actually bring it back where they always were yeah, into a guided in modern world medical setting 
so that you can take it with your therapist and that it's actually part, not a single, it's not a single, and they come to the end what you just asked, like how they work. It's not a single thing where you pop a pill and then you find, yeah? It's part of your healing, but like it's, it should be seen in like a, in a, in a therapeutic concept where the therapist is the one and legit trip. This is why it's called a trip. Yeah. And you need a trip right. guy like who guides you to do through, through two important things through the trip itself. Yeah. But then also the months and years after, because you gain a lot of insights. Yeah. It's not an artificial, which I love. Like it's not an artificial way to make you happy. Like take SSRIs. Yeah. Right. The, the standard thing. They manipulate you. I give an example. If somebody lost somebody he loves or she loves, yeah, and is is sort of grieving, yeah, psychedelics will not manipulate you into not grieve because grieving is positive because it shows that you love the person you lost. But psychedelics would help you understanding the bigger concept. That's the big difference. They're not manipulative. They, they, as you said perfectly, they showed you your place in the world, why the world is awesome. And that has an even better impact if you have a therapist sort of, again, not just guiding you through the trip, but also like through the weeks and months after when you implement those learnings and lessons uh, into your life. But that's just like the concept yeah, so, we want to go. So, so let's talk about the, uh, I want to make sure that we come back to that, but let's talk about the mechanism for a second. And um, you mentioned the broader platform, et cetera. And so that would include things like MDMA treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, et cetera. So many of these recreational yep. drugs being used in a therapeutic setting, and I completely agree with the way that you're describing it, helping people process by opening their perspective to a broader way of thinking about it, right? As compared to an SSRI, which is a serotonin uptake inhibitor, it effectively makes you feel good because you're not able to reduce the quantity of the natural hormones that make you feel good, right? Yep. That's not a solution set to basically tell everyone that, you know, you should just feel good, so we're gonna give you a pill that makes you feel good. This is actually a much more um, solution oriented dynamic. How do you process the pain that you're feeling? How do you process the emotions and the experiences that are preventing you from, um, succeeding in a path that you want to pursue? So yeah. talk about the mechanism and then let's come back to this guided concept. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking about like, I always say that before I start about the mechanism, uh, um, is to talk about, is it's extremely hard to describe a mushroom trip or in any psychedelic trip because it's in, in sort of the very true meaning, like it's, it's a mystical dimension. It's by the way, most religions are based on mushrooms. This is why all the prophets and founders of religions use pictures because they can't actually describe what they've seen. Yeah. And this is why the whole Bible and, and every actually richest book is full of pictures, like pictures, like allegories are in English. Yeah. Just saying that before, because I try always to get it across, but like, I also have to use words, which a lot of them are religious words, which I know whoever looks at us now and uh, watches our, our podcast, if I use the word God, for example, then um, a Jewish viewer have a, has a little bit of a different idea of God than a Christian than a Muslim. Than a, so, so this is why I try to stay away, but I can't actually because it is a religious mystical experience, what you have in one way or the other. Yeah. If I try the first uh, sort of the, the, the mechanical side, we have something in our brain, which is called the default mode mechanism. So that's where your ego is created. So somewhere in your brain is a part which says you're Michael, yeah, this guy I'm talking to is Christian. We are two different people, yeah, and your part will remember everything which makes you you, yeah, all the pain, all the happiness, all your social relations, all the experience, everything which creates the personality of Michael, yeah. So in the moment you take psychedelics and some stronger, so for example, DMT, which is the ingredient ayahuasca, which we also research at the Thai, is very strong or ibogaine, yeah. Some a little bit weaker, like psychedelic mushrooms, which is why they are a little bit of an easier. So, but in any form, in any 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 psychedelic, it reduces the this uh, this part where your ego is created. Some put it really to zero, yeah. So meaning 
your ego literally dissolves, which we call mm-hmm. in the in the in the psych- uh, psychological uh, world like ego dissolution. So mm-hmm. the Michael, as you know, vanishes or at least is reduced. Yeah. The good thing is, or the amazing thing is that at the same time, something else is emerging. So we can give that now the name of a soul and we're in the religious terms. We can say it's your true self. It's your inner voice. Yeah. I think humanity has found a lot of things or of words for this soul in itself. Again, whatever few it is, like some might be spiritual, my religious, might not, but something is emerging. So that's what every single person is, is talking about. And, and these things being, if I simplify, because also the amazing thing of psychedelics is that they seem to give you psychologically what you need in this very moment. So this is, for example, just saying like why people who are very depressive can have a wonderful trip because people are always asking me, are not all depressive people having a so-called bad trip? No, it's actually not because they might need something positive. While actually I, in the most positive moments of my life, had actually very, very, what you would colloquially call a bad trip, but they are actually not bad. They are very challenging. They're not fun because they show you something which you should know at this very moment. Yeah, so just saying, so this is the amazing thing. You can do 10 uh, psychedelic trips and they're gonna be very different. They're gonna be similar, but very different in the in the message. So anyway, so, but if I go back to sort of this ego dissolution, um, I would say two things are common what everybody is reporting. In the moment your ego goes down, you realize it's exactly by the way what you said. I mean, you put it very perfectly that everything and everybody is collected, uh, connected, and that we part of something positive. It's sort of that sort of feeling of yeah interconnectivity, yeah, or of we call it of being the oneness, being one with other people, and so and one big thing of in general of, uh, of, of psychological problems, of mental health issues, is that people feel disconnected to their fellow friends in the high school, to the world, to anything. You feel alone and whatever. And psychedelics give you back this sort of feeling connected to everybody and everything, nature, people, animals, anything. Like it's very pantheistic in a religious point of view. And then the second thing is that you see your true self. And that would be like sort of, because I know it's, a, it's an investment podcast and obviously we can talk about it. I think this two companies going to change meaning the world somewhere and, and it's going to definitely change um, mental health, how we treat mental health issues. But I want to also send sort of a personal message because you can learn a lot of psychedelics, like how to be happy, even like, or in general about the, the mechanisms of happiness. And one thing is that, you need to know what you really want in life. And that sounds so easy, like, uh, of course, like, yeah. But most people either don't know what they want and what makes them happy, or they don't dare to accept it, yeah. So, and I think, meaning that was one of the lucky things my parents always taught me, like I always knew what I want, yeah. And I was sort of, um, how do you say, daring to just say, look, this is what I want, this is what I do. like. I think it's actually not complicated. That makes you really happy. Yeah, and I think happiness is connected to a healthy form of egoism, but not in a bad way. Egoism just means like you should live life as you want to live it and find people who overlap with you, who sort of where this matches. This is true for relationships, for business relations, whatever. So, but if you think about like how we brought up, like since you're like a baby, people tell you what you have to be, how you have to fit in, like what is the right Michael doing, da 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 da. So like. Over the core of your real essence, you have this sort of garbage which other people put on you. And someone, as I said, some people completely forget what they really want under the garbage. Some people kind of remember but are afraid of saying no to a lot of things and people, whatever. So and psychedelics now put this garbage completely away. Yeah. So you look at your true self and realize what do you want? Like what is good for you? What is a life you want to lead? Yeah. And it can be, by the way, different to everybody. People are always asking me, especially, by the way, the finance people. And I had this fear. I give, I admit it. Like when I was doing psychedelic, I was like, hey, I, I love investing. I love my running my family office. Maybe I come out of it and then I'm going to want to be a farmer in Argentina. And I, so this was my fear. Right? So truth is, if I would have really wanted to be a farmer in Argentina, that I would have realized that. But then it would have been good. It would have been maybe 
for the moment have been disruptive because it would have changed my whole life, but it would have been good for me. In my case, it actually showed me that I'm doing exactly what I want to do. So in my case, my, my mushrooms were incredibly confirmatory, uh, or confirmatory uh, on what I'm doing. But anyway, so these are the two things. You feel connected. Sorry for the long thing, but I always get carried away. Uh, you feel connected to the world uh, and to everybody and everything. And you realize what you really want. And these are two fundamental um, fundamental traits you need to be a happy person. So that's a, I think that's a great transition to talk a little bit about, you know, maybe why now? Why is this becoming important now? Because your, your speech, and first of all, I would just want to inform everyone that um, this interview would be exceptionally difficult for me to conduct in German, which is your native language. So I really, really appreciate you doing it in English. Um, and I know how hard that is. So I, I, I just want to make sure everyone is aware of that. Um, the, the dynamics, when we go back to SSRIs or, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of the, the, the uh, Louis CK line, you know, everything's perfect, nobody's happy, right? We get in magic tubes, we fly through the air to different locations, we have the opportunity like to uh, like have our idea. material wants and needs met in a manner that throughout our society, any time in history, it would have, um, it, you know, you never would have been remotely close to the level of meeting of the Maslow hierarchy, the bottom layer of needs that we are today. And yet people seem miserable. They don't know where they fit in. They don't know how they manage the transition that we're going through. You and I have talked about the idea that we're in a transitional period similar to the late 19th century, right? Basically the 1850 to 1910 time period where you had similar dynamics and similar frustration with society. Obviously, in the United States, it, it catalyzed in the Civil War. In Europe, it catalyzed in, in many different types of wars that occurred. The formation of nations, right? The, the creation of, of Germany out of you know, principalities, etc., Huge elements of societal change as we transition from agriculture to industry. And today we're seeing a lot of those same challenges as people say, where do I fit into a system that is increasingly automated and driven by artificial intelligence? How, how do I participate in this society? It feels very much like we're trying to all figure out ways that we can be reconnected without explicitly saying that, right? And we're diagnosing it and saying, you're unhappy here, let me make you, force you physically to be happy through an SSRI. Um, you know, the opportunity to treat that and begin to ask those questions and have that genuine interchange that is that guided trip that you're referring to strikes me as very timely. Maybe you can talk a little bit about your perspective on that. Yeah, again, very complex, but cool, cool, cool topic. Uh, so first of all, I think what I want to mention is uh, is that how little, and that is not your answer yet, but like just like because I wasn't aware of it. So I do invest a lot in biotech. So biotech is one of the three sort of themes in my family office. We invest in, we do biotech, then we do a lot of crypto, and we do a lot of what we call deep tech, space tech. So although I was so much into, or I'm doing so much biotech, when I first started thinking about uh, psychedelics as mental health, the whole topic of mental health was not on my radar. Yeah. So no. I thought it's a niche thing. Yeah. So, and sadly, if you look at the numbers, every single subversion, like anxiety, addiction, um, depression, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, OCD, like give me one mental health issues and you always have hundreds of millions of people uh, suffering from it. So it's mm -hmm. in as a whole, unfortunately, mental health, and by the way, also the related costs, yeah, uh, become one of, if not the number one problem for the world, for our healthcare system, whatever, yeah. So, um, and it's striking how little innovation for that has been till we started a tie, actually. So the reason is multifold. The reason is, A, we actually started understanding the brain over the last 10, 15 years. So before, all the drugs which are on the market, SSRIs, benzos, whatever, they were almost like hit, hit and miss. Like they were done and he's, oh, if I give it to that. But like, so just now we really start to understand how the brain works. Uh, then we had these incredible big um, uh, crime almost, I would say, or like, to give you a nicer word because it's recorded, but like what the, especially the US government did in the 70s with um, 
labeling psychedelics in a negative way for pure, by the way, political reasons. There was, mm -hmm. they faked studies. Why? Because the hippies were going uh, against the Vietnam War. Um, uh, the hippies were actually, if you think about it, they were doing the good stuff. Like they were doing the positive stuff. This is, it's so easy if you take psychedelics to realize where these make love, not war, and everything comes from. We're all connected, whatever. And it didn't fit into the time politically. So they started saying, oh, this is bad. You, Vietnam War is very positive. We need to do it like, yeah, you must be crazy if you go against the Vietnam War. Hence, psychedelics seem to make you crazy. That was sort of the very short political thing. So, by the way, everybody who's watching, read Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind. There is no better sort of history of psychedelics, how they work and whatever. It was an amazing book which changed the public perception uh, of, uh, of, of psychedelics a lot. Anyway, so, we, so short version, we're starting to understand it. We, start, we, we started to, thanks in that case to us, to dare to touch sort of the only group or maybe the, at least the best group of drugs, again, which can, can solve it. So that is sort of the historical part. Like on the, what you said, like what I'm thinking a lot with sort of a negative connotation, but I'm trying to change it, is like the, if you look at the numbers of mental health issues for every single subversion, and if you take a 20 year chart, yeah, then they all look exponentially growing, which doesn't make any sense because they're not infectious. If you look, I showed the chart to a friend without saying which diseases it is and say, what is it? And he's like, it's an infectious disease. I didn't put any numbers on it. So, so it's not obviously, depression is not an infectious, but like it looks like because the world is becoming more depressive, the world is becoming, so, so there are two explanations for this, and I think both are true, that the simply one is we diagnose better, yeah? So things which like 20, 30 years ago, you would have brushed off, you know what, Michael, go to the gym, man up, is now a depression, thanks fully. So, so we now have, as we have a better understanding, we also have, a, and it's getting destigmatized, like, so we diagnose better but i think that's just half of the truth yeah what i deeply believe is that the world we live in but even more the world we all are about to build and again we a little bit i mean you me and all the people watching this podcast because we are like very optimistic for the future we invest in crypto we invest in space tech we do all this fancy stuff and honestly i love it i'm just not i not just love investing into it i really look forward to a world where we're gonna live, and it's gonna come in our lifetime, where we're gonna live for hundreds of years, where we have space stuff, like the world's gonna be fucking awesome. <laughs> However, I think it's just a small amount of people who subscribe to that vision being awesome. I think 95, I mean, an incredibly amount of, I don't know the number because nobody made the research yet, but I, my personal guess is it's around about like 95 plus. Like I think the vast, vast majority of people is terribly afraid and maybe they can't even um they can't even express this my my, my, my say, take a bus driver yeah he might not have heard how or he might not understand how ai works yeah but somehow he knows that his job will not be there anymore and like me maybe not intellectually maybe he can't tell you how the self-driving bus will work but he knows he's gonna be redundant in the world we live in and that creates a lot of fear yeah, and that fear, I think, is is terribly for the for the global mental health. Yeah, and well, it, it, it it plays into so Robert Sapolsky has the book, you know, zebras don't get ulcers, right? It's that low grade stress of how do I participate in a society that is working to obsolete me, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I give you, I give you, and I want to come to that because it's we talked about it in the brief, like it's this eighteen fifty analogy. I want to say one very, I know it's very cheesy. Uh, so, but I, I hopefully people appreciate it because it's my personal theory about being happy. Yeah, is like we what we need um, of uh, of to be happy in every single world. I think you need. I need. I think you need three things. I I think you need any form of faith. Um, can be an organized religion. Can be spirituality. But I think you need to believe, or you want to believe that there is something higher. There's something more to that life than just the life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for one reason, which nobody of us talks about it because we completely eliminated it from, uh, from, from our life is death and mm -hmm. not your one and not my one. I'm terribly terrified about my parents dying because I love them so much. So, and it frightens me. Yeah. 
And again, fear is one of the big negative sources of mental health issues. So any form of spirituality, I don't want to make the case now if God is real or whatever, like, but if you believe in something which is going beyond that life, it's reducing the fear of death of yourself, but even mm. more about the fear of your loved ones dying. Because mm. you would know if it happens, and it's going to happen, because that's the cycle of life, yeah, that you see them again in some form or the other. If you so that's why I think religion is so important. The second thing is everybody of us wants and needs meaning. We need to know when the morning where we wake up, why we're here, what we do. We want to have a, a purpose in life. And the third one is we want to have love. Love means a partner. Love means children. Love means also your friends can be a dog. But you want to have social, a social life. And sadly, if you, we look at the world, again, we're building, all these three things are crashing down. Like religion, all-time low. Like the belief in anything. Yeah. Then what I just said, um, the, um, the, the, the purpose for most people is like vanishing because they see their job vanishing in front of their very eyes, robots, AI, whatever. In 10, 15 years, most of the job, somebody, I think it was Peter, or somebody told me like this crazy number that one fifth, I don't want to make it up, but it was one fifth, something like that, of the jobs in the US are related to driving something. Yeah. So if we have self-driving cars and trucks, one fifth of the people will not have a job anymore. Yeah. Yep. So, so purpose is crashing. And then also very important, we forget that the way we, and I don't want to sound because I know I'm from the joint like Christian is so conservative, but like classic models of family of societies are also crashing. Yeah. The, I don't think that, or I don't want to say that what we may be rethinking is not, is, 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 is not maybe equal, but like for a while that what, what people were holding on family structures, like, I don't know, neighborhood circles, everything is, is also vanishing. Like, long story short, all these three things, and now I come back to that, psychedelics give you back all of it. Yeah. So they give you what I said before, they give you this enormous connectivity to other people. So it's bringing back love, so to say, that's why I said it's cheesy, in one form or the other. They show you what you really want. So they give you purpose because you can design your life in a way. And they show you that there is something more. Again, religion is, is everybody's personal. But they show you that I deeply believe, I'm very spiritual, that there is more to that. We can, again, we can give it names. We can, And I think it's very hard, actually, always that our language is prohibiting to really, really, really come to the point. But like it shows you there is more to that. So this is, I think, why psychedelics overall are that. So coming back now to what you just said, the 1850s, that's my big, actually, if you would ask me about my one sort of dystopian worry, is actually that analogy. And um, finally, like some weeks, months ago, Elon Musk and, and Kathy Wood, they had this um, conversation on Twitter. It was actually the positive one where Elon made the point, like, oh, the stock market is, is, is very highly valued if you compare market cap to GDP. And then Kathy said, hey, if you look at the 1850s to 1910s, actually the stock market was valued two to three times higher. Yeah, And it's exactly what I also believe but I have unfortunately a negative takeaway, but I have a solution. But like negative takeaway is like, if you look at this time, why was the stock market higher? Because it was the, if you go and I'm a history geek through all times, this is the one which resembles ours the most. You had an elite, which was dreaming the future in a very positive way. Like the two, my two favorite examples are yeah, Jules Verne, yeah, the author who wrote about flying to the moon. He wrote about undersea boats, like, a lot of things he thought about actually came true. Yeah, um, you had um, uh, what's the term? The, the the World Fair, I think, is the English term, like the exhibition. Yeah, uh, in Paris, which gave us the Eiffel Tower. So it, all of these sort of and and if you would have talked to a person in 1870, they would have said, yes, we're gonna go to the moon, we're gonna be super healthy. There was this. However, it was just the elite. Yeah, and again, a big amount of people were terribly frightened. Why? Because like what I just described now, they realized maybe subconsciously just like that they will not be part of that future because back then we had an agriculture society, which, and again, hindsight, it's always easy, but like we were at the dawn of the industrial society. But unfortunately, the industrial society, a lot of people were not needed because or needed a different way in it. 
Mm-hmm. Fast forward, I think we are at the dawn of, we're going from the industrial society, we're leaving that into the AI and data age. And again, this is going to make hundreds of millions of jobs redundant. We need to rethink, if you think like we had to rethink, like we live, cities were born, like everything will change. And again, majority of people is frightened. Why I'm all saying that is because unfortunately that time, and I think there is a direct uh, causality, led to two world wars. Yeah, I can always make the point, ah, the first world war was started by the Archduke uh, of Austria being shot in Sarajevo, whatever. There are sort of individual happenings, but I think the underlying is we saw an extreme um, flight almost to both communism and nationalism. Because if people are afraid, and I always come back and Dune is coming out now soon. The, the movie where is this famous uh, quote of the the, um, uh, the lead actor in Dune, like uh, fear is sort of, the, I can't quote it now, but the fear is the, the sort of source of everything bad. Yeah? yeah. So if people are afraid, they're going to do very, very bad stuff. That's one of the very sad truths about human race. Yeah. Fear makes us very, very bad people. Yeah. They made us communists. They made us think. They made us ultimately commit a genocide. Yeah. It was always fear. Yeah. Which was the driver. And this is what I'm afraid of. Now coming, what could be the solution? And by the way, I need to make the disclaimer. This is not now a tie related because obviously that's sort of a vision and this this is not the medical case today. But like, I believe that we hopefully have to start to define certain, uh, um, I would say, yeah, to define certain issues as a mental health issues and we don't define them now. And fear of the future and the feeling of not fitting into the world, I think in 10 years gonna be an acknowledged disease. I think you're gonna go to a psychotherapist and say, I can't cope with the world anymore. I can't cope with the, the speediness the world is turning. I, I am afraid because my job is gone. How can I learn something new? Because people always say, ah, take a 60 year old bus driver, he should just go back to uni, yeah? Let's assume he intellectually can. Let's be optimistic. If you're 60, you can't because your brain got literally. It's just not there. Yeah. And and, and psychedelics can give you the back. There are going to be so many new sort of reasons. Or one positive example is the UK already started at least. They have a minister for loneliness. Because being lonely again in this world is terrible. And by the way, you can directly, there is a direct, there is a lot of great studies who show that if you're lonely in any age, but especially in the old age, your health will deteriorate. We need, so we need uh, social interactions. So give magic mushrooms to everybody in all people's home. They're going to have the time of their life, not in the moment, just like, but they're going to start, I trip with my parents. Yeah. And they were like, and they, they were not depressive. They were like every 70 year old couple is. They were closing down. They couldn't cope with the world anymore. They didn't make new friends. Yeah. Uh, whatever. And now they're like, hey, we're going to the gym. We're making new friends. We're getting social jobs, whatever. Yeah. It's, yeah. Long story short, I think we have 20, 30 years of crazy, not just technological disruption, but also societal disruption ahead. I think it can go really wrong, but I do hope that psychedelics can play a role in sort of easing us into a new era, which is going to be totally awesome. We just need to make that move into it. It's it's a really interesting point when you bring up the dynamics of the 1850s to the 1910s, right? Because you, you had similar dynamics. You know, I, I, I'm much more familiar with the United States, but I know similar components existed in Europe. We talked about that in terms of the formation of nation states, etc., but you very much also had a dynamic of self-medication in that time period, right? The alcoholism exploded, um, particularly amongst the male population. The abuse of opium, et cetera, um, was a significant contributor to both the challenges of China as well as you know, in, in patent medicines, et cetera. The, the abuse of many of these drugs, um, which were industrialized in that time period, um, was a self-medication process that I would suggest is very similar to what we see today, right? We see people overly medicating with alcohol. We see people Opioid. overly medicating with opium, cannabis, et cetera, right? They're, all of these drugs that involve effectively anesthetizing yourself to your current situation to make it tolerable, right? Like a pain management drug that you take because you have chronic pain 
those have exploded in use. And again, what you're doing at Compass and Atai is you're searching for a solution. You're effectively you know, playing the role of, can we actually help people come to terms with this disconnectedness and this feeling of loss and fear in a way that is different than the current treatment protocol, which is just to you know, give them a pill and tell them they're happy and prevent the, the brain from uptaking the hormone that uh, tells them they're happy, right? So it sticks in their system longer. Um, when you think about what that might look like from a business case, and you think about the dynamics, and I know there's limitations in terms of projections, but the current business model in pharma, for the most part, is get them on a reg, you know, almost like a um, uh, software as a service model, get them on a pill, have them take the pill can, for the rest of their lives. It's not really a solution, but it addresses, you know, the, the immediacy of the pain, right? It becomes a chronic condition. How does the business model change when you start talking about solutions? Uh, by the way, first of all, again, it's a cool conversation because you put it perfectly. What is the root case of many mental health issues? It's actually pain and trauma. Yeah? Yep. So this is why, again, if you talk about in detail about top psychedelic works and if you look, if you read um, uh, reports, what people tell, it, it's often going to your, yeah, to the roots, to your trauma and it's helping you dissolving it through the pain. It's easing you into it always it's drive. Yep. So, and again, what I said before, it needs to be done with a therapist. Because it can be psychedelics are not a party trip. You don't want to do that at like a party because like you don't want to have the deep insights and maybe painful insights into your life and so on while you dance. I mean, maybe some people are like I like thinking going back to what they were always used to. They should be taken with a therapist. This is what we are developing them for. Yeah, as a part of a bigger sort of therapy with the therapist. What is the good thing is. I, they have the potential, I have to say that that way, because we are about to prove it once and for all in an FDA like Meta, which is going to be massive, by the way. I'm very, very proud of that because in like some years, I don't have to say legally, I see the potential of psychedelics, which I do very much believe in, but we're going to prove it like, yeah, like you and prove it for any other drug, like you get it approved by the FDA. Um, and they have the potential to cure mental health issues for good, yeah? Yep. We will see if you might want to have then a trip every year for positive reasons. And our life is not easy. Don't forget what I just said. Like, we're going to go into a very complicated world. So it might be that you say, look, even if I'm cured, I need it in a positive way. So, by the way, they zero addictive. They're the counter thing of addictive. They dissolve addiction. We have a whole, uh, a whole branch where we work on psychedelics to cure opioid addiction and all the numbing ones. Um, but like, so... But yes, they have the potential to be curative, yeah, which is going to change the whole way we look at whatever care system for, for mental health. By the way, positively, because a lot of people ask then, oh, does it mean someone or psychiatrists psychiatrist are, are unemployed? It's the opposite. Yeah, At the moment, I think they have the sad job to wanting to help people and don't have the tools for it. Yeah, In the future, they can focus on the growth and the positive side with their patients, but they're going to see that somewhere in the one patient is healed, but then the next is going to come because I think ultimately the total addressable market is 100% of the world population. Mm -hmm. Because in one way or the other, we all need it. Yeah, uh, Some more urgently because they, they are where we say they have a, a really a disease. Yeah, But like, honestly, if everybody here uh, would think about it, um, are you really, truly, deeply happy in a bliss version of a religious meaning? Most people aren't. They should be, though. That's, I think, is the, the reason why we're here, um, to be truly happy. Um, and I think, uh, so I think someone, so we're reducing, so to say, the, the, the we, we're bringing, hopefully, the, the, the number of people who are kind of addicted to SSRIs to zero and offer true solution, but to a bigger, way bigger uh, group of people. Well, and, and so, so effectively what you're saying is you will shrink the usage per capita, but you will dramatically expand the number of users is, is your thought process. Yeah. And I, I would echo that. I mean, many cultures have an element that's similar to the experience I went through, right? The functionally identical to doing discovering my spirit animal, going on walkabout, you know, that transition from childhood to adulthood is a lot, is, is much of the way I think about the experience that I had, right? It was it allowed me to make that transition from a world that was very controlled by parents, et cetera, 
to one in which you ultimately have to become very self-defining. You also bring up a really interesting comment in the idea of recurring treatment. Effectively, life can be thought of as a series of trauma events, right? That's what aging is. Your cells lose the ability to repair. Your brain suffers accumulated injuries. Your ego suffers accumulated injuries that closes you off. You were talking about that in the context of your parents. When you think about that sort of maintenance routine, is that does that ultimately turn you know the um, annual physical right almost into a uh, okay let's take your blood and let's really figure out what's going on with your world to to help you you know uh, set your goals for the next year the next twelve months etc. Is that kind of the vision that you see for something like that? Definitely. Meaning again, this claim about the way we just went public with a tie. Yeah. Like this is like sort of more like a philosophical discussion, but I do think, I, I believe two things. First of all, um, another podcast, but like I really, this is my second other big biotech thing. And I think finally you, you because you mentioned that they're very interlinked. I yep. think I, I, um, the, my main two uh, uh, focuses are mental health and aging or actually curing aging, because I deeply believe aging is a disease. We just haven't understood it yet. And because we didn't understand it, we build it into our lore and our culture as if it's uninvitable. Yeah. And every religion, religion sort of is built like around that. But I do think, I do think, by the way, because people then always like, ah, Christian thinks we're going to live forever. I think we want to die somewhere. I think also the, the limit that our, that our life is ending gives it the beauty. But who says that this can't be 400 years? Yeah. So what I think age is over. So we starting understanding aging of the body, but exactly we said the same, like we, 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 we go to an annual checkup and we, we know that something bad is happening to our body, but we can reverse it or at least slow it down. Exactly what you said, like our brain, our mind accumulates issues, scars, uh, whatever, but we can work against it. Yeah. Um, and Michael Pollan said it, I give it to him because then I saw my quote, but he said it perfectly. You want to do it once in a year, psychedelics on your birthday. It should be mm -hmm. a regular thing, which you again, do in a, in a, in, as a form of celebration, as a ritual. It's not something you pop just because you're bored with a shaman, with a, um, with a psychotherapist, but it's, but it's, it might become a regular, positive, regular treatment, not because it's not curing the original problem but as aging like if you want there is the next one like and the older you get i think our mind um our mind needs it so when you think about some of the, the you know here in silicon valley um you know there's a lot of emphasis on things like micro dosing etc um i tend to not be a huge fan of that because i do think that it becomes much more like an ssri right you're substituting an alternate reality um, for, for reality as compared to helping you learn how to process what's going on in a different manner. Do you have a similar take on that type of dynamic? I mean, again, from a business perspective, it'd be easy to tell people here, take this, you know, uh, capsule, you know, gelatin capsule that has an element of psilocybin or MDMA or, um, it, you know, peyote or anything else in it, right, to brighten up your world, right? I often hear it described in that manner, which I find personally a little frightening, right? I mean, if you if you need to brighten the world on a day-to-day -day basis, there's something else probably going on. That, I totally agree. I even will go one step further. But first of all, like, again, I said it before, in any form, like in terms of uh, psychedelics, in terms of if people look at my investments, they're always like, oh, you're so adventurous. Actually, I'm not. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a super coward uh, in terms of my health because I, I want to live for very long. Again, by the way, my view is like, I want to decide myself when I die, when I have enough of this. At the moment, I don't. I love it. Um, and I, um, so, so I want to live forever or at least for very long. So this is why I'm very, very risk averse in any form. This is why it took me so long to, and I didn't take any drugs, why I don't drive a car and all of that. Uh, and the same, by the way, is true for investing. People look at my investments and like, oh, I, I remember in 2017 um, and 18, we started Compass and Atai. The only two people and a big shout out in the world who uh, trusted me uh, first uh, were Peter Thiel, a mutual friend, like Mike Novogratz, who actually brought actually the first investment opportunity or the first company to me, and then Louis Bacon. The rest said, you're crazy. Yeah, like yeah. it's not gonna work. It's gonna ruin your career. And I was like, nah. Interestingly, for me, that was always, again, 
obviously because I had this deep conviction out of my own trip, but it was always because if I looked at the data, I was like, I know this is going to work out. Like it's like, it's not that I, and it's not, not an idea. Like we have so much, even medical data, because some of these drugs were legal somewhere, or at least anecdotal data. So for me, a tie was always an incredibly downside protected investment. But they are not a crazy one. It was the opposite. While if I bet on a new, completely new cancer drug or whatever, I don't know if that works. And there could be a negative surprise risk. I don't see that negative surprise risk uh, with psychedelics. So it's just saying like, so I'm way more downside or way more coward and way more conservative yeah, than people might think from the outside. Coming to your question of market dosing, this is why we really don't know. So it might be that they go. So we do studies around microdosing. But they are almost none. Microdosing is a new concept. It was not there in the in the last century. Hence, it's not research. So my honest answer is, we really don't know if microdosing has the value of so far a small group of people. It's nothing compared to the anecdotal evidence we have with a full trip is reporting. If I look at what, but that now what I'm saying now is just my own theory. Again, we're working on it to get more information. If I look at what microdosing does, you have in a trip, you have practically two things which are happening. You have, let's call it the spiritual or psychological side, if you have a real trip, yeah, what we discussed, like ego dissolution, healing trauma, all the positivity, learning about yourself. And then there's one more thing we haven't discussed yet, positive. You, your brain is literally start, starts growing, yeah? So which we call neuroplasticity. So certain parts of your brain are um, growing. Yeah. So I like to describe it not so scientifically like a blank canvas. So there is new space in your brain for new experience, for positivity. Mm -hmm. If you had a real trip at the beginning, you had these enormous, um, enormous amount, enormous boost of positivity, which helps you filling that blank canvas in the months later hopefully together with your therapist. This is why I'm so focused that this should be medically used only with a therapist together to fill that blank canvas with something positive. To so literally, I like to say, rewrite the story of your life. Yeah. If you're just doing microdosing, you create a blank canvas because what we can see already is that the neuroplasticity is happening with microdosing, but you didn't have the boost before. My theory is like, if you're a happy person anyway, Actually, microdosing might be good for you because you have the positivity and you're going to fill the canvas in the right way. However, if you have troubles, depression, whatever, and you think, you know what, I'm just going to try with microdosing, you're missing out on the positive boost at the beginning. And then maybe the canvas, because the canvas is neutral, uh, is, is written, uh, is filled with negativity and you actually might unintentionally sort of make the, the mental health stuff worse. Yeah. So I, short version, we don't know. Personal thing is like I would be careful and at least would consider in which time of uh, of my life am I? Am I in a positive state? Might be good for me. For example, I think it could be. This is what we're looking at. It could be that you want to have a one full trip every year or whatever, and then you could do microdosing to enlarge the effect. Yeah. But again, combine it with the positivity. But I would be careful with it. So let me, let me ask a very practical question as it, as it relates to these two companies um, and the general prospect of taking drugs that have historically been available and repurposing them, right? So when we talk about uh, Compass, we're very specifically talking about psilocybin and the treatment of depression. When we talk about a tie, we're talking about the broader class of drugs, everything ranging from MDN MDMA that we talked about to my understanding is there's research on ketamine and all sorts EMT, of ibogaine, salvia, right. everything. All right. So when we think about those types of dynamics and the economic component, it is, does it immediately become a generic or is there a formulation and a protocol that you can effectively protect as an investor? Yeah, uh, it's the latter one because otherwise we couldn't invest. Yeah. Right. Um, and for example, and I'm happy about the discussion because I, I think it's very sort of every discussion I'm always for free speech is a good one. Like, and I know there are people who are like a little bit uncomfortable to say the least. And they say, ah, it's a God given molecule, which by the way, personally, I believe, uh, and now Christian is patenting it. Yeah. Isn't that bad? Yeah. 
Um, and I think it's not a it's not a clash at all. It's actually I deeply believe in capitalism. That's yeah. uh, the way to go. We have an FDA regime, which is good because it makes you prove things and look at risks, whatever. But unfortunately, the FDA regime has its cost. It's like drug development is incredibly expensive. Hence, we have to invest a lot. Yeah, and we have more than more than eleven at the time. Well, most likely more than like we have at the moment more than eleven. Uh, drugs in in various stages in a tie yeah so it's a very costly undertaking so hence we need to be rewarded because people we just did an ipo people give me money because they think they're gonna make more money with it yeah so yeah we need to make a business model out of it so hence yeah this is why by the way maybe notice i said at the beginning that a tie uh from my point of view has all psychedelic drugs on its platform which make commercially sense. This was mm. one of the selection mechanisms when we looked at which psychedelics are out there. Yeah, we had to look at it. Is there a way to gain intellectual property? Yeah, uh, and patents. Because if not, yeah, then um, then you can't make a business out of it. Yeah. And the second mm. question, so the two questions we had for a tie when we were onboarding new drugs was like, can we find a patent solution around it and an IP strategy? And second has the drug um, a place from our point of view in the in the sort of medical regime yeah i give you my counter example yeah i always jokingly say in a country where it's legal there is nothing more nice than a nice stay on the beach with lsd yeah lsd is a great drug yeah uh very positive but it has a very messed up practically not existent ip situation it was very hard for us we didn't see a real ip strategy but also it's a 12 hour trip. So if I have the choice as a therapist between a four hour roundabout psilocybin trip and a 12 hour LSD trip, you're always gonna take the four hour trip because it fits more in the treatment regime. It's very practical. So we don't see, uh, we don't have LSD. Yeah, although it's a very famous one. Yeah, because we don't see that commercial angle. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's a little bit like just the background. So how can you gain? So how can you um, how can you uh, uh, um, get a patents or whatever on natural compounds? It's a little bit like people have shown with cannabis, you have various ways The one is some I meaning you can't patent the original molecule. By the way, for everybody, I don't think your clientele is like very left. Yeah. But for everybody who's watching who thinks <laughs> still, yeah, is uh, it's not good. Like, we're not gonna take away mushrooms of people. I'm not gonna knock on your door and say, oh, I see you growing mushrooms like um, I have a patent on it. Because I don't, I don't have the patent or we have, we have the patent on natural stuff, yeah? So, but that's a different world. That's like people who do that, I think, should be allowed to do it. I'm very much for decriminalization because if you're dead spiritually, that you wanna grow mushrooms yourself, if you take the effort, it's not easy, um, uh, then, you deserve it and it should be decriminalized yeah but like again we talk about the medical world in the medical world you need to synthesize it yeah and synthesis uh, the synthetic process jesus english is uh, not always easy so for example in psilocybin compass has the opinion and i haven't seen a better one or actually i haven't seen any that the, the way they synthesize it and where they have the patents on is the only way to synthesize it theoretically somebody could someone come up with it with a new one but i doubt yeah so Production is, a, is an important point. Then you're gonna have data exclusivity. Yeah. So if you do the studies for a certain um, indication, you own that indication. Yeah. So then the, 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 um, the therapists have to use yours. And by the way, it's, this is a good thing with how the healthcare system works. If we approve a certain drug for a certain indication, then it's also just paid by the healthcare insurance. Mm -hmm. if, they use this one yeah so so there are multiple ways to to protect it and I meaning that's obviously they come back like for a tie as a as a company it was our main main effort to build up intellectual property to be able to justify raising a lot of money which we need to build the leading mental health company in the world well i i have to tell you so i became aware of your investments um through you you know you have me included on a newsletter that you send out to potential investors etc um i immediately saw exactly what you see right which is there is a wide body of literature the history there is very clear that this can have an impact i mentioned my personal experience with it 
you know, when you when you think about that sort of dynamic, what you really were doing, the only thing you had to leap was the perception, the investor perception and the regulatory framework, right? That that's one of these really winning combinations where I, I'm incredibly excited about what you're doing. You know, one because I think that you're a wonderful person, and I'm excited to see you succeed in this context. Thank you. But the second component is, is that I really agree with the general philosophy that you're talking about. We're moving from an environment of treatment of a symptom and a maintenance regime that has people deeply ha unhappy and is leaving us with an increasing cost around the societal ills of higher levels of suicide rates, higher levels of loneliness, you know, the depression component that you, you characterize as, as a near infectious disease. Some part of it, I agree, is higher um, identification, but some part of it really is what you're highlighting, which is as a society, we are struggling with the transition that we're underway. So I am in, I'm personally very excited to see how this goes um, moves going forward. Christian, I'd love to have you back on in the future to talk about developments at Atai and Compass and anything else that you're working on. Would you be willing to- Totally, totally. I love, again, I love talking about my stuff because it truly excites me. I'm always, yeah. I just invest in or build companies which excite me and I always hopefully think Hopefully that means also it excites other people. And again, my, my basic assumption is, I can just repeat it, we're building the most awesome world. Yeah, we just need to make sure it has a place for everybody. That's the risk of it. But in generally, I'm sort of this eternal optimist uh, for the future and uh, happy to check in on longevity, space tech, whatever you want to talk let's, about. Let's absolutely do that. Let's come back and talk about longevity in our next discussion. But this was absolutely fantastic. I can speak to the audience and share that you really are this optimistic person, that this is, you know, you truly believe the world that we're facing is one that is going to be better. And I know in today's world of cynicism, particularly in a post COVID type environment, there's a lot of frustration around that. There's a lot of fear. Hopefully, we can have a couple of conversations that help people understand both how they can invest to make that better world come forward, and also maybe on a personal basis, think about some of those aspects as well. So, Christian, this was fantastic. I always love talking to you. I really look forward to doing this again soon. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Yeah, read the book from Michael Pollan. And by the way, one more book you should read is from my friend Brian Murarescu. It's called The Immortality Key. That's more the spiritual side. Uh, I think you need both in your life. Excellent. Fantastic. So we'll come back and talk about that next time. Thank you so much, Perfect. Christian. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Bye. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.